I think it's time to get started, so we'll do that. Continuing from last week, looking at church leadership from a little different perspective, I hope. I'm sitting down for some physical reasons, not important, not serious, uh, not crucial. But if I stood for the whole half an hour, Marianne would be yelling at me. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. Now, Dennis uh, was insisting on teaching Sunday school this morning, but I refused to give him the microphone. So, just so you know. Let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning that once again we can come together, study your word, and we'd ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to grow in Christ as we look at these things together, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, just a couple of... Um, Tim, can I get rid of that guy right there? I can't see my screen. Uh, j there, oh, perfect. Um, just by way of a quick review from last week, um, we looked at the biblical aspect of church leadership. And we saw that there were uh, two names for church leaders. Uh, Paul sent Ephesus for the elders. That's the Greek word presbyteros of the church. And he tells them, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you Overseers, that's the Greek word episkopos. They're the same thing. An elder and an overseer is the same thing. And then he goes on to say, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought uh, with his own blood. And so we have elders as an office in a church, overseers as the function, overseeing the business aspects and uh, spiritual aspects and so on. And then the job is to shepherd, uh, which is their responsibility. So they're the same individuals who are to shepherd the church. We saw that there is a, another um, office in the church, if you will, not a church of leadership, but a church of service, where Paul in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, for instance, uh, greets the saints at Philippi uh, with the overseers and the deacons. And so the deacons, and we know from other passages, which we'll look at down here, uh, those who serve the needs of others in the church. And we'll talk about how that works here and who's involved in that. Now, we saw historically last week that up to the 1500s, and the 1500s was the time of the Reformation, that the Roman church controlled the thoughts and the beliefs of the entire uh, area of Europe. All the European nations uh, were under the authority of the Pope of Rome. And so there was no such thing as an individual church. Now there were individuals uh, prior to the 1500s who tried to break away and establish a biblically oriented church, but that was often met uh, with the death penalty. Uh, Rome controlled very carefully what went on. Now we also saw last week that priests had replaced elders in the 3rd and 4th century. So in the 200s and 300s, when Latin became the language uh, that was most commonly spoken, because that was the language of Rome, Italy, and so on, <clears throat> that the word presbyteros in the Greek, elder, uh, sounds just like or very much like the Latin word for priest. And they became interchangeable so that elders disappeared and priests came on the scene from that point forward. Uh, and so the church then, of course, had to make use of priests and that led to the weekly sacrifice, the, the body and the blood of Christ and so on because priests are mediators between God and man and they carry out sacrifices. Then in the 1500s, uh, opposition then began to rise for at the almost identical times in Germany and Switzerland, which led to the Protestant Reformation. It happened in two places almost simultaneously. Martin Luther, of course, gets most of the credit, but there was a man by the name of Zwingli in Switzerland who did exactly the same thing. 
So local Protestant churches then began to rise based on biblical teaching rather than tradition. So for the fir first uh, um, 1500, well, after the first couple of hundred, then from 300s on, uh, tradition took over from the Bible as the primary source of doctrine. So uh, the first generation reformers, uh, the most prominent that we know best, of course, was Martin Luther. He officially began the Reformation in 1517 when he nailed his 95 theses to the door um, in, uh, in uh, Germany. And so um, he wrote things like this. Now, um, Luther was a very outspoken guy. Uh, he was almost a classic German in some ways. I can say that because three quarters of my relatives are German. And I'll tell you, they can be really stubborn. Now, I didn't inherit that gene, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true, uh, Germans will hold their own. And he said this, every pious Christian man should open his eyes and not be misled by the hypocritical Roman bull. A bull is a letter sent out uh, from Rome by the Pope, which, which gives certain directions and so on. Bulls and seals. He said that Christian man should stay at home in his own church, um, be content with his baptism his gospel, his faith, his Christ, and with God who is everywhere the same. So his issue was uh, salvation by faith alone, belief in the scriptures alone. Uh, and so he said, let the Pope remain a blind leader of the blind. Um, obviously, uh, Martin Luther was taking great chances in what he did. His life was often under threat. But fortunately, in Germany, there were a number of people who saw it his way, and they protected him uh, throughout his life. Now, uh, the second generation reformers then came on the scene, um, and probably the most prominent, um, the ones that we'll lead up to this morning, uh, was John Calvin. Um, now, John Calvin, born in 1509, was only nine years old when Martin Luther or, well, whatever, 17, eight, eight or so years old, when Martin Luther nailed those theses to the church door. Uh, so he was just a kid. He grew up in, in France uh, and eventually then uh, came to Geneva as he was older. He, he accepted Christ, uh, became a strong Protestant. He had originally been a Catholic. His father wanted him to be a priest, in fact. But he lived in a, in a time when there was no separation of church and state. Church and state were one. There was never a separation of church and state until the Constitution of the United States. And until that time, uh, there, church and state were always the same. Whatever the state said you'll be, you will be. Uh, and so um, Protestantism had been declared the official status in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, and so he could go there and safely teach and so forth, and he developed a great many Protestant doctrines during that time. Um, Catholics by that time in Geneva, Switzerland, were banned from the city. You see, the state said everybody will be the same thing. People went to bed one night as Catholics and woke up the next morning as Protestants. Now that didn't mean that they were all got saved overnight. Um, but whatever the church fathers said, that's what you did. I, and so Calvin recognized, though, as people began to gather together as Protestants, and they began more and more to study the Bible, he recognized there needed to be a church government, not just the government by the city fathers, and by the government telling you what to believe, and how to believe it, and so on, and how to worship. He wanted church governments in each of the local churches. Uh, so he defined the church this way. He said, wherever we see the word of God, purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, in the way the Bible gave it to us, there is not to be doubted a church of, that a church of God exists. So he said, any group of believers uh, in Christ getting together form a church. Now that didn't mean that everybody in Geneva, Switzerland, suddenly joined a Protestant church. Um, but there were many, many 
believers who indeed did form churches. And so he desired that the church have its own government, and that's what we'll be talking about this morning. He said the church cannot stand firm unless a government is constituted as prescribed by the word of God and observed in the early church. Now, last week, we looked at the teaching of the Bible, which was the teaching of the early church until elders got replaced by priests uh, and the Roman church became the center of all Christendom. And so then uh, he recognized that uh, there needed to be established a consistent form of local church. So the Geneva City Council liked his argument and they enact enacted his ordinances in 1542. Now, five or six years before that, he wanted to have church have its own government, but the city council actually kicked him out of Geneva. That was a temporary episode in his life. Uh, he went elsewhere um, for a while uh, and then came back because things weren't going well with Protestantism, and they invited him back, and that's when he began much of his writing. Now, he saw church government to be God's way of appointing men because God isn't here in person. He said, we're now to speak of the order in which the Lord has been placed, pleased that his church should be governed. For though it's right that he, God alone, should rule and reign in the church and that he should preside and be conspicuous in it and that its government be exercised and administered solely by his word. Obviously, we see God uh, really as the chief here. Uh, this is Christ's church and so on. But he goes on to say, yet as he, God, doesn't dwell among us in visible pre uh, presence, so as to declare his will to us by his own lips, he in this, in this uses the ministry of men by making them, as it were, his substitutes not by transferring his right and honor to them, but only doing his own work by their lips, just as an artificer, they have someone who carves out of wood and so on, uses a tool for any purpose. You know, he's, he basically felt that God would use people in the church as tools to make that church functional. So he goes on to say, the ministry of men which God employs in governing the church is a principal bond by which believers are kept together in one body. So you need leadership in a local church, obviously. So he says in giving the name bishops, now uh, that's a term that stuck around for a long time for episcopats or overseers. Uh, and even our King James Version used bishops. Uh, today, most modern translation actually translates the word overseers, the Episcopats, as overseers, because that's what it means. And presbyters, he said, or elders, and pastors. He said, I go those indiscriminately to those who govern churches. I've done it on the authority of Scripture, which use the words Episcopats, overseers, and presbyteros, elders, as synonymous words, as we saw in that passage in Acts. And so he says in the Acts, the elders presbyteros of Ephesus, whom he said to have called together, he, that's Paul, in the course of his address, designates them as episcopos. So that's why we put those two words together as the same office. Now he also recognized the need for deacons. And he said the care of the poor was committed to deacons. And we'll see that in a little more detail of whom two classes are mentioned by Paul in the epistle of the Romans. He that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. So he says it, you know, those deacons ought to be distributing to the poor and ought to be looking after people who have need. So that he separated then the elders uh, from uh, the deacons so that the deacons could serve needs uh, among the people. He says, although the term diaconia which is what we usually call diaconos, has a more extensive meaning. Scripture specifically gives the name of deacons to those whom the church appoints to dispense alms, take care of the poor, uh, constituting them as stewards of the public treasury of the poor. 
Then he says next comes pastors and teachers with whom the church can never dispense and between whom I think there is a difference. Teachers preside not over discipline or the administration of sacraments or admonitions or exhortations, but the interpretation of scripture. And so pastors, he had up here, discipline, administration, so on. Now that's altered um, over the years to some extent, but at least he certainly had the idea. So to sum up his idea of church government, and when we were doing this back in 1981 and 1982, at that time the church did not have a written form of church government. Uh, basically in 1981, uh, the church had trustees because they didn't have an, enough people qualified to be elders or deacons. And so we started from scratch and we ended up with the very similar uh, pattern to what um, Calvin had come with, up with 500 years before. But he, he saw pastoral leadership as pastors and teachers. Now, in Ephesians 4.1, where we read that Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Now, this word pastor in many modern translations is translated shepherd. It's the same word. Now, the, the word for shepherds in the original language is often translated then uh, pastors. But he saw those two together. Just don't want to get too technical, but there's one definite article in the Greek between pastors and teachers, meaning they're essentially the same thing. And then he also then saw elders and overseers to direct the administration of the church and deacons to assist in ministry to the needy. So he, he had a pretty decent plan. Ours is, has minor differences, but not that great a difference. So uh, from that then, we see that elders, the position of the church, overseers, the function of the church, shepherds, the responsibility of elders, uh, Paul considers a very important office in the church. And so he goes, uh, not only Paul, but Peter also, they both go into detail of what the characteristics of an elder uh, should be, and then uh, also of deacons. Now, I'm not going to spend huge time on all the words, but most of them are pretty self-explanatory. He says in 1 Peter 5.1, I, I exhort the elders, presbyterat, usually refers to older men, but not necessarily. Uh, the elders among you shepherd again the flock of God that is among you. That's their, jo their job. Remember, a shepherd in those days didn't chase sheep around with dogs. Shepherds led the flock. The shepherd, if you go to the Middle East today, you'll see wide open spaces. There will be a shepherd or two walking along, and behind him come the sheep. Uh, so a shepherd led. Uh, they didn't herd, if you will. And so he says, exercise among you oversight, not under compulsion, willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, not to make money out of it, but eagerly, not domineering those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And so those kinds of descriptions then give us a feel for what kind of person ought to be an elder. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, let presbyteros who rule be considered worthy of double honor. Those who rule, there were, there were some elders worthy of double honor. Now the word is translated double honor in the Greek refers to paying somebody, to giving somebody a remuneration for doing something. And so, of course, uh, that is the rationale that you pay a pastor. He's full-time. He can't have another job. It's impossible. Um, but most elders uh, uh, are not uh, paid. They're generally uh, strictly volunteer uh, in, in the things that they're doing. But there is room for a pa paid elder that we would call a pastor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And so that's uh, the issue of what a pastor does. For the scripture says you shouldn't muzzle the ox when it trades out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. In other words, feed the ox, the poor guy. Uh, and so uh, in 1 Timothy 3.1, another set of 
suggestions relative to elders. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer or episcopos, he desires a noble task, a noble task rather. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. That means there's nothing in his life. Uh, hopefully, in the last six months, he hadn't been in jail for stealing money from his company or something like that. Um, but yet, you know, he can't carry a bad reputation into the job as elder. He has to be the husband of one wife, a lot of debate about that, one wife at a time, or um, more than one wife at different times, and so on. Uh, one could argue about that ad nausea, but he's to be sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard. That doesn't mean he has to be um, in a position where he has to teach, but at least he's capable, certainly, of presenting the gospel and understanding the word. Not a drunkard, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Going on in verse uh, 4 of chapter 3, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. If someone doesn't know how to manage his own household well, he care for God's church. Does that mean that if someone's uh, child, son in this case, uh, grows up to uh, and goes through a rebellious time or remains that, that he can't function? Uh, I don't think so. I think this is talking about having a reasonable home life, a reasonable household uh, where things are not chaotic and so on. Because if he doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Big mistake churches can make is they see a young man, he's real bright, he's been saved maybe a year, he's very enthusiastic, he comes on to the board and he's not ready uh, for the things that sometimes boards have to face. Sometimes you have to face disciplinary things. Sometimes someone is wildly out of control and you got to deal with it. He may have a difficulty uh, seeing that and dealing with that sort of thing and so on. Verse 7, he must also be well thought of by outsiders. He doesn't have a bad reputation community, so he won't, won't fall into the disgrace and the snare of the devil. Uh, Paul also gives Titus suggestions about elders. He said, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town. If anyone, again, he mentions the same thing, above reproach, husband and one wife, children believers are not open to the charge of debauchery, or insubordination. Um, not every child we have is necessarily going to become a believer. We recognize that. Um, but um, if they are totally antagonistic to the church, that might make it difficult for an elder to have a function, but not necessarily. We have to recognize that there are um, uh, problems uh, in any household, maybe, um, but debauchery or insubordination um, may be a difficulty. He goes on in Titus 1.7, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Same thing, not arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so he can give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict you. In other words, you better know the word because there will be people who will sneak into a local church with false teaching and somebody's got to recognize that and deal with it. Now, the next on the list then uh, of church offices are, is diaconos or deacons. Um, and we see that in Philippians 1.1 uh, where Paul greets the elders and deacons. And he says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, understand Christianity, and know what it's about, and let them be tested first, let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. He said, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, the same uh, phraseology, managing their children, their own households well, for those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to just finish up uh, with something that we dealt with 
and Mick will remember these days and some of the others of you. Um, what about women as deacons? Now, you can use the word deaconesses, but I think that's, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's not a good word. We don't do that in English. Uh, we don't feminize words, a deacon, a diaconate, a deacon. And he says, I command to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, he says, but the word diaconos in the church of San Crea. Welcome her in the Lord and so forth. And so from that passage then, uh, one would assume that Paul might not be averse to having women as deacons. Now, remember that tradition, although much of it disappeared after the Reformation as far as Protestantism is concerned, we have our own tradition. And there are many churches out there today that would think we are totally off base <laughs> having women as deacons. Uh, Baptist churches are very good at that. We grew up in one. Uh, women were not deacons because they saw that as leadership. But see, that's where the mistake is. Leadership or servant. Leadership are overseers. Deacons are servants. They're working in some particular position, even in those churches that say women can't be deacons, I'm willing to bet that a lot of the work gets done by the women in the church, not the men. But anyway, this is a very difficult verse, 1 Timothy 3, 1, 11. It's right in the middle of the passage on deacons that we just read. And most of our English translations translate it this way. Their wives, deacons' wives, must be dignified, not slanders, sober-minded, faithful in all things. But that's not, this is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to translate, not because of the translation problem, but because of the tradition problem. And I think that the New American Standard Bible got it right, because he, it doesn't say their wives, it says women must likewise being dignified. Right in the middle of a list of deacons, there's men deacons, now there's women, then there's more men deacons. I believe these are the women deacons. They also need to have a good reputation, not gossip and so on. Uh, now, um, many people would argue with that because there are two ways you can translate. These are all good translations. Uh, both the ESV, the English Standard Version, and NASB. But most versions don't like the idea of having women as deacons. Let me just show you real quickly. I'm running out of time. Uh, but um, in uh, verse 311, there, where it says, likewise, their wives should be of good co character, the word gunekas means either woman or wife. And the second word uh, here means likewise and refers to what has been said about the deacons. Women, likewise, and then semnots is good character. And so our English translations do something interesting. They put their wives, that's not in the original, and must be, it's not there, it's always in parenthesis in these kinds of uh, interlinear Bible. And so I, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. Now this is, and I'll finish, pretty much finish up with this, um, this is a note out of the Net Bible. These people are Hebrew and Greek scholars, and when they run into this word, deaconesses, um, they translate it um, in various ways, but this is their description of why you can translate it as woman. It says the Greek word is gunikos, which literally means women or wives. It's possible this refers to women who serve as deacons. And then, of course, he puts deaconesses in there because he wants to be careful. He doesn't want anybody to throw the Bible in the wastebasket. He says the evidence is as follows. The immediate context refers to deacons. It's right in the middle of that context. The author mentions nothing about wives in elder qualifications. Well, if it's important for a wife to be a certain way for a deacon, what about the elders? It's never mentioned. It would seem strange, they say, to have requirements placed on deacons' wives 
without corresponding requirements placed on elders' wives. And elsewhere in the New Testament, there's room for seeing women in this role. Now, he also goes on to give the other side. But let me just put it in context. Here we got deacons and the way they should do things right in the middle, verse 11 in the NSABP, or the NSAB. Uh, the women must likewise be dignified. Then he goes back to male deacons and, and goes on from there. Uh, so that's the reason we felt that it's reasonable. And so today, we do have deacons or diaconos, one who serves. It includes Tim Kaur, Deb Kaur, Marcy Wandell, Bart Parp, and Mike Horton. Now, as elders and or overseers, the office and function, we have a senior pastor elder, Jason Kleppel, that could have another um, stroke in there and say teacher. But we also have Elder Steve Sitka, who is the chairman, uh, and Elder Rick Laflam and Adam Beard. And so, it's this time of year then, Skiff Lake Bible Church opens the opportunity for men to express a desire to be an elder or overseer. After meeting, they meet with the present elders. Those names are presented to the congregation for consideration. And then, so it's done this way. These are the related dates this year. April 14th, submission of the names to the elders. Someone feels that he would like to serve as an elder. He may have some special interest that he wants to be involved with. April 21st, he, the announcement of the names that have been submitted to the congregation, including the names of the present elders. There's a deadline for submission of concerns then to the elders. If someone in the church says, boy, I don't think he ought to be an elder. Uh, I, I, I know what's going on in here, that, or the other thing. So I don't think he should do that. Then a final ballot is set. Absentee ballots will be provided to the church. Then May 19th, the annual biz business meeting is directly after the worship service, and we have little ballots for approval. We don't elect people. We approve those who have submitted uh, their name. And so that finishes this little series then, which we like to do uh, on a yearly basis. Next week, I will be starting... Uh, our summer series uh, from the Book of Romans as announced by one of my grandkids here. Uh, this is Tucker Schmidt. He said he'll be neck back next week. I can't resist putting those great grandkids in my slide. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning uh, that you have made so clear in your word what it is you want from us as a local church in the way of church leadership. And we just pray that those things that we do might honor you in every way. Might uh, this uh, approach um, bring a, a, about a good, solid uh, local church, not falling ever aside, but to continue to follow your word in every way. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for your time. See you next week.